All right, welcome back everybody um, to our second lecture on Revelation and Daniel. Uh, we are continuing our, uh, um, our study there in chapter 11. Uh, we had just mentioned, or we were talking about the two witnesses that God would send. Um, just some thoughts on, you know, how would these two witnesses appear on the earth? Uh, how would they be raised up in the middle of the tribulation? And I uh, just sharing a few possibilities how this would happen. Let's pick up now from verse 7. And let's please read till verse 14. So Revelation chapter 11, verses 7 to 14. Could somebody please read that passage for us? Uh, maybe Prince or, or Prince, if you can read Revelation okay. 11, 7 to 14, please. Yeah. Yes. When the pen is <clears throat> when the pen is the testimony, at the best uh, that assigned out of the bottomless pit will make way against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their hate bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into the grave. And those who dwell in the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gift to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwelt on the earth. Now, after the three and a half days, the breast of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on them who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tent of the city fall into the earthquake. Seven thousand people were killed, and the rest were upright and gave glory to the Lord of heaven. The sound woe is burst the second, uh, burst. Second. Hmm. Or the second woe is burst. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Okay, thank you. So, um, this passage is telling us what will happen with these two witnesses. So, like we said, you know, this is going from the middle of the tribulation till the end of the tribulation. So these two witnesses are bearing testimony to Christ. They are preaching, they are proclaiming, they're doing mighty signs and wonders. And uh, of course, people all over the world are seeing and hearing what they have to say, uh, which is very possible today, right? Uh, given all the technology and the connectivity that we have globally, what, what's happening in one place can be seen anywhere and everywhere all over the world. And so people's nations let, of all nations of, uh, are seeing, hearing what these two witnesses are doing. Now, towards the end of this tribulation period, right, so the ministry of these two witnesses is going on throughout the second half of the tribulation. Towards the end, uh, this is verse 7, the beast. It's talking about the beast. Yeah, this term is introduced here. The beast to ascend from the bottomless pit. Now, uh, this term will be used again in the 13th chapter, uh, when we talk about uh, the Antichrist. Right? So this beast here, we could say at this point, um, this is referring to the Antichrist. Now he comes at the bottom of the split because he's literally, he's, he's empowered by you know the forces of darkness. We will see that. So the Antichrist kills these two prophets of God. And uh, their bodies are lying in the street of, 
of the city of Jerusalem. Right, so now here in verse 8, this, the city of Jerusalem is referred to as Sodom and Egypt spiritually. So it's telling us that at that time, you know, the spiritual condition of the city of Jerusalem is going to be so corrupt, meaning it's it's gone. It's like Sodom and it's like Egypt. Egypt known for its idolatry or worship of false gods. Sodom known for its immorality. And so uh, Jerusalem has become like that spiritually. But anyway, these two false prophets, their bodies, uh, they're killed by the Antichrist. Their bodies are lying in the city of Jerusalem. And it says that for three and a half days, um, this is verse 9 of Revelation 11, and the whole world is watching this. Uh, you know, we, we can use this as an indicator of how close we are towards the fulfillment of this, of Bible prophecy. Because if we went back in time, say, 30 years ago, uh, for the whole world to watch, to see something 30, 40 years ago, for the whole world to watch something would not be possible. You know, you, yeah, it would come in the newspaper or something uh, one, or, uh, one or two days later, but they can't, they can't see it in real time, right? But uh, it, verse 9 is saying people from tribes, tongues, nations will see their bodies, right? So today we are living in a time when this is possible, when you can see, you know, people can see on their mobile devices, you know, in real time, you know, live streaming, uh, they can see videos, they can see live reporting, you know, from the city of Jerusalem, they can see directly on their mobile phone, they can see the dead bodies of these two people, right? So about 40 years ago, not possible. Here we are in a day and a time when Revelation 11 verse 9 can actually be fulfilled. And people can all around the world can see, you know, what's happening. So this says here that people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days. That means the bodies will be lying there in Jerusalem for three and a half days. And then something powerful will happen. It says um, at the end of the three and a half days, their bodies will come alive and God will raise them up. And while everybody is watching, their bodies ascend into the sky, into the clouds. It says the enemy saw them. Right? Now, is this possible? Of course. You know, we know Enoch, uh, Enoch was taken up into heaven. Elijah was caught up into heaven. The Lord Jesus was caught up into heaven. All these are physical movements. And so for these two witnesses to be resurrected and taken up into heaven, absolutely not a problem. Right? We, talk, we talk about the rapture that has taken place, that would have taken place before the beginning of the tribulation, everyone taken up into heaven. So for these two witnesses, for their bodies to be resurrected and uh, taken up into heaven, God can do it, right? So when that happens, it says, verse 13, there's a great earthquake. Uh, a tenth of the city of Jerusalem is destroyed and uh, about 7,000 people's lives, people are killed. And uh, this causes many people to fear and, and you know, recognize that, you know, hey, all this is, this is God. God is doing something, right? And so uh, uh, the, the uh, angel announces here, okay, two woes have passed. There's one more coming. I mean, it's the last judgment, the last woe, which is the uh, bold judgments. So we've had the... Um, seven or the first set of seven seal judgments first woe second woe which is the first set of uh, uh, the second set of judgments that's the uh, seven trumpet judgments and then the last set which is the bowl judgment so this this angel is announcing the third woe third set of judgments is coming and at that time while the angel is announcing that there's going to be this third woe or this third set of judgments. So during the seven year tribulation, there are three sets of seven judgments each referred to as a first, second and third woe. 
I mean, it's, it's declaring judgment. So when this angel announces that there's going to be this third war, this third set of judgments, uh, at that time, Revelation 11.15, the seventh angel is sounding. So this is the conclusion of the second war or the second set of seven judgments. So when the seventh angel sounds, like I mentioned in the previous lecture, there is a proclamation, there is an announcement that the kingdoms of the earth become the kingdoms of our Lord. So uh, it doesn't mean it's happening at that instant. It's an announcement. It's going to happen. And like we said, shortly after that, you know, Battle of Armageddon comes, the Lord Jesus comes, and he conquers all the nations, right? So it's an announcement that that is going to happen. So let's read Revelation 11, verses 15 to 19, please. Somebody could read that. Revelation 11, 15 to 19. Anybody whose mic is okay? Kanan, if your uh, mic is okay. I, I will read. Please. Okay, can you hear me right? Good, we can. Yeah. Then the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world have become the kingdom, kim, uh, kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall <clears throat> reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God and their thrones fell on their faces and, the, and worshipped God, saying, uh, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, <clears throat> the one who is and uh, who ha who was and who is to come because you have taken your great power and reigned the nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and the, and that you should reward your servants the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great, and should, uh, should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, uh, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Mm. Thank you. So the seventh angel sounded. So that's the last of the seven uh, the trumpet judgments now when this um, you know when when the seventh seal was opened there was silence in heaven i think you know there was no activity similarly seven trumpet is sounded there is there's no judgment on earth yet, per se but there's an announcement there's a proclamation there's great celebration. The kingdoms of this earth, uh, of this world, have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. So there's this proclamation. It's going to happen, you know, and uh, all the kingdoms of the earth will be taken over by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what we said, that will be fulfilled at the end of the Battle of Armageddon, Revelation 19. But now it's an announcement. It's going to happen. And uh, the 24 elders are worshipping God and they are saying, God, you are going to reward your servants, the prophets and the saints. You know, uh, many of the servants of the pro many of the prophets were killed and the saints were martyred. You know, God is going to reward them. God is going to, you know, um, uh, in some way, uh, you know, what, I want to, what I want to say is like he will take vengeance upon the nations for the the way the prophets and the saints were treated. So they're just saying, God, you have redeemed us. You have uh, brought us in and you, oh God, will judge the nations and you will reward your prophets. Uh, and uh, they're announcing that you will destroy, uh, you will destroy those who destroy the earth, meaning judgment on the people who have been destroying. And John sees the temple of God. He sees the ark of God in heaven. Right. So that's the real temple, the ark of God, the presence of God. So Revelation chapter 11. The, Revelation 11 verses 1 to 14, the first part of Revelation, is taking us through the three and a half year period with respect to the two witnesses. And then we come back to 
the time in the middle of the tribulation where the seventh trumpet has sounded, making the announcement that this is what's going to happen. Now, Revelation 12 is similar to Revelation 11, meaning is giving us some insight what's happening from the middle of the tribulation till the end. But this is with respect to what the devil is going to be doing. What is Satan going to be doing during that three and a half year period? Right? What's he going to do? He is going to be in panic mode. He is going to know that his time is short. He's got very little time left. That is three and a half years, literally. And he is going to do, I mean, he's going to, you know, it's like uh, he's operating uh, uh, desperately. So one of the things he does is, as we will see, I'm just giving a little preview of chapter 12, and then we will read it. One of the things he does, Satan, he tries to penetrate heaven, his final attempt. He tries to break through into heaven. But he can't. He tries to, you know, so angry, like, let me get my hands on God. <laughs> no, no way. There's Michael and the archangels. They keep Satan and his demons out of heaven and push them off to the earth. So he comes back to the earth, knowing his time is short, three and a half years left. And what he does is he goes after Israel. The nation of Israel. Now, why is he angry with Israel? Because it was through these people that Jesus Christ came into the earth. So it's in one way um, Satan's trying to Satan is trying to take out his anger against these people for ushering Christ into the earth. So for the next three and a half years, that means from the middle of the tribulation. To the end, he knows his time is short and he's going to go with great vengeance against Israel. But more specifically, we will see in Revelation 12, against those who believe in Jesus Christ. Those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ and have the word of God. He's going to go very intensely against such people. The last three and a half years, that's what he's going to do. Okay, so that's what chapter 12 is about. But to convey that to us, chapter 12 uses a lot of figurative language or what people call as prophetic imagery, a lot of images. Now, these images are not difficult to interpret. It may look difficult at the very beginning when you, I mean, if you read it initially, but actually it's not difficult, right? So let's go ahead. And uh, I think we've, we've referenced this chapter uh, a, 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 on many different occasions. So it should be uh, fairly familiar to us. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Uh, we will read verses one through six, please. Somebody could read that. Revelation 12, one through six, maybe. Kiran, if you want, can you read that for us, please? Yes, sir. Now a great sign up appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. When being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold a great fairy, fairy red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven di diadems. Diadems. diadems on his head. His tail drew, drew a third of the stars of heaven, and drew through them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour, devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron 
and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there there one thousand there one thousand two hundred and sixty days mm, thank you all right so let's try to understand this i just want to point out um uh, the end of verse six one thousand two hundred and sixty days we're seeing this again right it's uh, 42 months approximately or three and a half years so once again the timing of revelation 12 you, and it's going to be repeated again later on in this chapter is the middle of the tribulation so he's talking about something that's going to happen in the middle of the tribulation and then continue but he's giving us the background he's giving us the main players or actors uh, who are going to be involved uh, first of all uh, so starting from verse one he talks about a woman clothed with the sun the moon and 12 stars so when we read up that you know a woman sun the moon 12 stars that looks like a strange picture but uh, when we look in the bible in genesis 37 and verse 9 so if you turn with me there um, genesis 37 and verse 9 uh, you find that when Joseph had his dream, God used similar, uh, Genesis 37 verse 9, uh, God used similar picture. Uh, you know, he said, Joseph said, I have a dream. I've dreamed a dream. The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed toward me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and they rebuked him, saying, Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come down, come to bow down to the earth before you? Genesis 37, 9 and 10. So it seems it's, it's very clear here that the same image, sun, moon, 11 stars, the woman with the sun, the moon, the 12 stars in this case, represents the nation of Israel because God used that imagery in the same speaking of Joseph, who was one of the 12 stars, of the 12 sons, um, He's using that to speak to him about the nation of Israel. So we can clearly see this woman here represents the nation of Israel. The other indicator is from this woman came a male child. And who is this male child? It tells us here in verses 4 and 5 that this male child was going to rule the nations with a rod of iron and that that same uh, terminology is used in Revelation 19 and verse 15. So we turn to Revelation 19 and verse 15. Uh, it's used about Jesus, Revelation 19, 15. I was talking about Jesus, that out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, with it he will strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. So um, uh, we can, you know, we, we immediately reference this to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we also see, I think it's in Isaiah 11. Uh, let me just turn there, Isaiah 11. Um, and verse 4, Isaiah 11 and verse 4, uh, it's clearly talking about Jesus, who is the anointed one. And there, once again, it says, he will strike them with the rod of his mouth. Isaiah 11, verse 4, talking about Jesus. So in uh, looking at, um, you know, all of these scriptures, it's easy for us to recognize that this male child who will rule the nations with the rod of iron, who was caught up to God in his throne, this is Jesus Christ. So who's the woman? The nation of Israel. She's the one who gave birth to this male child. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who's going to rule the nations with the rod of iron and the one who was caught up to God. And then we see a red dragon. That's in verse 3, a great fiery red dragon. Now, what does he say about this red dragon? Seven heads, ten horns, um, seven diadems on his heads. So uh, the number seven, as we said in the very beginning, represents 
seven represents perfection. So he's saying that this this dragon, Satan, is you know perfect in his headship and, and ten horns, horns representing power, authority, leadership. You know, he's he's so strong in his in his power, and he's got diadems on his crowns on his head. And so he's been given authority on the earth, right? So that's this red dragon. Now, who is this red dragon? Now, uh, if you, you know, we will read on and we will see in verse 9 that this great dragon, it, it says, Revelation 12, verse 9, this great dragon, the serpent of all, the devil and Satan. So this red dragon is interpreted for us clearly there in Revelation 12, 9 as the, as the devil, Satan, right? So the red dragon represents the devil, Satan. The woman who has a garland of sun, moon, and 12 stars, she is the nation of Israel. The male child is Jesus Christ. Right? And we understand that very clearly. And another side note we can see in verse 4 that this dragon drew a third of the stars of heaven. Revelation 12 verse 4. Drew one third, one third of the stars of heaven. So the stars of heaven here are imagery or image of the angels of God. So when Satan fell, or when Satan rebelled against God, he took with him one third of the angels. So this is where Revelation 12 verse 4 is the scripture from which we, uh, we say that Satan in his rebellion took one third of the angels of God with him at that time in his rebellion. And of course, they were cast out of heaven at the time. So what 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 is the dragon doing here in verse 4? It says here the dragon stood by the woman to devour her child. So that means Satan made a first attempt to devour Jesus, to destroy Jesus Christ. And we know, and if you look at history, we know that at the time of Jesus' birth, Satan attempted to do it. How did he do it? How did he attempt to do it? Through the decree of King Herod. King Herod said, you know, go and destroy all the children two years and below in the region of Judea. Right? So you can see how the dragon worked through um, somebody in leadership. In this case, it was King Herod in an attempt to destroy the male child, which is Jesus Christ, as soon as he was born. So that's Revelation 12 verse 4. So these are talking about events in the past, things that have happened in the past. Satan drew one third of the stars of heaven. That is one third of the angels. Satan made an attempt to destroy the male child, Jesus Christ, right? So this was there. But now we're coming back into what's going to happen during the tribulation. What's that going to happen? Verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God to feed her and keep her for 1,260 days. That means this is a picture that God will protect the woman, which is the nation of Israel, during that three and a half year period. Now, the second half of the tribulation is often referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, you will see that in, uh, uh, I think it's Jeremiah, uh, chapter 30, let me just look it up. Jeremiah 30 and verse 7. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Uh, it is often referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. So this is the second half of the tribulation. Is a time when Israel is going to face its worst time ever. We remember in Daniel chapter 12, when we read it, um, the angel Gabriel told Daniel that, and I'll give you the exact verse in Daniel 12. Um, the angel Gabriel said, um, uh, this is in verse, verse 1, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Daniel 12, verse 1. In other words, the angel Gabriel told uh, Daniel, you know, there's going to be trouble 
it like never before. And especially the reference to your people, but your people will be delivered. Daniel 12 verse 1. So that's what's happening here. Uh, Israel is going to see such great trouble, but God will preserve them. So when Revelation 12 verse 6 says that God prepared a place for Israel in the wilderness, it's, it's a picture of God somehow protecting uh, this the people. Now, uh, is it a literal wilderness that you know the Jewish people are going to escape into and hide? Uh, is, or is it just a figurative language that God is going to protect the nation? Well, I, I, I think it's it's more of a figurative language that, um, you know, that this is saying that God will protect them. But there are some who try to, you know, try to figure out where could this wilderness be where uh, the Jewish people could go and hide themselves. Uh, and so some people, you know, would, and then you would, you might read this in commentaries. Some people would say, well, the wilderness is uh, towards the east into Jordan. There's a lot of land that's like wilderness. And it's likely that the Jewish people will go and, you know, uh, stay there in safety. Uh, some even may think, well, maybe they go down into Egypt because in the past, God has used, you know, Egypt down south of Israel uh, as a place of safety. Yeah, you know, um, uh, but if you look literally these days, there really is no place of safety because, you know, if people want to attack, they can attack anywhere, given the kinds of uh, weapons that are available, missiles and aircrafts and all that. Uh, if you want to attack a people, you can attack them anywhere. So they're really physically a place of safety. Uh, it's not so easy unless they go underground, which is possible. Or we could just say, look, it's just telling us that God will provide a place of safety for his people, right? So I'm just giving you, you know, how different people look at verse 6, and it's repeated again later in this chapter. So let's pick up now from verse 7, Revelation 12, verse 7, and let us read till verse 12, please. Somebody could read Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 12 for us. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, was this, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out of him. Then I heard a lot loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a sort of time. Mm. Thank you. So, these verses, verses 7 to 12, uh, are describing, uh, you know, a scene of uh, heavenly warfare, spiritual warfare, a war in the heavens. It's saying this dragon, Satan, you know, he makes an attempt to penetrate into heaven with all of his angels. And, uh, but then Michael and the heavenly angels uh, just say, no entry. Yeah, they don't let uh, the dragon, Satan, and his demons even get into heaven. And so they're sent back to the earth, they cast out to the earth. Now, uh, and then there's this great proclamation in declaring the greatness of our Lord in Christ. And, um, uh, the accuser of the brethren, accuser of the brethren, he's cast down. And uh, and it tells us that uh, the people, the brethren, the people of God, uh, they overcome the adversary, the enemy, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of the testimony. And uh, and then it says, you know, verse 12, uh, 
the devil has come with great fraud because he knows he has a short time. Now, there are a lot of questions here with this passage, uh, especially uh, whether this is describing something that's going to happen in the tribulation, or is it describing something that has happened in time past? And so here again, you have two different, uh, you'll have at least two different, different viewpoints. There are some who say, who say Revelation 12, 7 through 12 is describing something that has happened in the past. But for me, my position is, or my understanding is, it's writing about something that's going to happen in the future at that time, in the, during the tribulation. Why do you say that? Well, the reason I say it is because verse 12 does say that Satan has come with great wrath, knowing that his time is short. And then it specifically says that, yeah, knowing that he has a very short time. Right? So it's saying that. So meaning is pointing to something where the devil's been cast onto the earth, knowing that the time is very short. And because of that, I, I, I feel that this is something that's going to happen, not something that has happened. And, uh, and uh, uh, when it does say, verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, uh, it's talking about how we overcome the devil, even now by the blood of the Lamb, but more so the tribulation saints, the brethren who are there in the tribulation, for them also, they overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb. Right. So we do so now, but this is also applicable to them during the tribulation. The other thing um, that, um, uh, that that's a point of uh, point to make note there is that the devil is called the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast out. So Satan is the accuser of our brethren or the brethren. The people of God. That's his job. He accuses them. Now, how do we understand this? Does this mean that the devil goes into heaven before the throne of God and accuses us, you know, personally before the throne of God? Uh, should we understand it like that? Or should we understand it as he's accusing us? to us before our God, bringing condemnation, guilt, and shame to each of us before our God. So again, here again, there are two different views. And then there are some who've built, you know, a lot of uh, ideas around Satan accusing uh, each one of us before the throne of God, and therefore we have to go before the throne to defend ourselves, which I don't subscribe to, because uh, we have an advocate with, with the Father, Jesus Christ, and when Jesus died on the cross, John 13, um, John 16, verse 8 says that Satan was condemned, the ruler of this world, the judge, the God of this world. He was condemned. That means the verdict was announced 2,000 years ago that Satan is condemned. We are acquitted. That's already done. So there's no more, no more you know, court case proceedings. It was all over on the cross. So there's no more you know, devil going before God to accuse us because the judgment of the verdict was passed on the cross already 2,000 years ago. And therefore, the New Testament calls us as acquitted people. That means we are righteous. We are not being condemned before God. We are acquitted by God. We are justified by God. So there is no more court cases against us happening in heaven. So therefore, when the scripture says here that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, I like to understand it the way I understand it is Satan accuses me directly, me before my God. So he tells me, Ashish, you are unworthy, you're useless, you're no good, God is upset, God is angry with you. So he's accusing me in my mind before my God, right? So that's the accus accusations of the enemy. It's not like he's going to heaven before God accusing me. That, that cannot happen because the court case was already dealt with. So he's accusing me directly before my God. He's the one who accused me before my God, right? So that's the way I understand it. So I don't, you know, subscribe to 
uh, there's, there's a lot of teaching that, that that's been going on, talking about the courts of heaven and people having to go, believers having to go to heaven, you know, come before God and defend themselves from the accusations of the enemy and all of that. I think all of that is made up. It's not real. Um, it's unnecessary uh, because the court case was already dealt with on the cross. You and I are acquitted. You and I are, there's no condemnation against us. You and I are already justified. We already have peace with God. The accusations we face is what the enemy brings to us in our mind today. And we have to use the word of God uh, against those accusations. And we declare what the blood of Jesus Christ has already done for us. Right? That's how we overcome the enemy. So that's another thought here from this passage about the accuser of the brethren. That's the, the, the work of the devil, bringing accusations and condemnations. So what we see here, and uh, so Revelation 12, 7 through 12, is in the middle of the tribulation, Satan is going to make one final attempt to penetrate heaven. He's not going to be able to do it. The angels of God, Michael and the archangels, will Michael, the archangel, and the other angels will prevent him, push him back, and his only option now is whatever he could do on the earth. And he will come with great wrath because he knows his time is short, meaning he just has um, three and a half years left. Okay. Let's read the remaining verses of Revelation 12. And we'll try to finish that before um, uh, this class is over. Revelation 12 verses 13 to 17, just four verses. Somebody could read that for us. Revelation 12, 13 to 17. Yes, sir. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cursed to the earth, uh, he pursued, persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given to wings of a great uh, angel, Eagle. That he might fly, uh, that he that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is, uh, where she is nourished uh, for a time and times and half a time. From the present of the present, so the serpent, from the presence of the serpent, uh, so the serpent. Uh, separate uh, water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth held the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had serpent out of his mouth and the dragon was in touch with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her, her offerings who keep the command help the testimony of jesus christ mm. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, verse 13. Now, when the dragon saw he'd been cast to the earth, what did he do? He went after the woman. Who is the woman? Israel as a nation. So, he's going to persecute. He's going to go after the woman. right? And um, uh, verse 14 says, but, you know, this woman had a, were given wings like a great eagle. So she could escape to a place in the wilderness where she's preserved for time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Time, one, times, two, half a time. So one plus two plus half, three and a half years. So once again, we can clearly say that Revelation 12 is talking about the middle of the tribulation till the end of the tribulation because it's referencing once again that three and a half year period. So for three and a half year period, Peter, Satan is going to go attack Israel. He's going to persecute. He's going to try to do all he can against the nation of Israel. But God is going to provide a way of escape to the people. Now, um, 
verse 14 talks about this woman having wings of a great eagle and he goes into the place of wilderness where she is preserved and nourished. So once again, like I said a little earlier, um, this could be a literal place, maybe in the wilderness. We don't know where exactly. You know, people have tried to uh, uh, propose certain areas where Jewish people could escape in the wilderness. Um, or this could be some something very figurative, like wings of an eagle that you know that God gives uh, these people a supernatural ability to escape uh, from all the persecution that Satan brings. Now, sometimes you might find people talking about the wings of an eagle representing America. All right? Now, I don't subscribe to it. I'm just saying, if you do find it, you can think about it. Uh, saying, okay, America would be that nation that comes and protects Israel, you know, uh, because the great eagle is a symbol of uh, America. Uh, but I don't think that's what it's referring to. I think it's just figurative or prophetic language. That's verse 14. Uh, talking about God giving the people a supernatural way of escape from the attacks of the, and the persecutions that the enemy brings. Now, how exactly is Satan going to bring this persecution? That's described for us in verses 15 and 16. It says, the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood against the woman. Now, what does it mean, spewing water? Um, uh, we don't know for sure, but if we use prophetic language to interpret it, water like a flood, uh, if you look at Revelation 17, the 17th chapter, verse 1 and verse 15, in Revelation 17, one, verse 1, it talks about the great harlot sitting upon the great sea, the water. And then verse 15 talks about water representing people's nations, tribes, and languages. That means it's talking about the nations of the world. So if we use that prophetic language or picture here, when it talks about the sa Satan spewing water like a flood, the flood is representing people's nations uh, uh, who are motivated or moved to come against Israel by the enemy. And this is uh, uh, very, very, uh, you know, I feel a very correct understanding because later on in chapter 16, we will see that demons are released on the earth to go and instigate people to come together for the battle of Armageddon. So there again, demonic powers are causing nations to come together for a final battle, right? So based on these two, you know, um, corroborating references within the book of Revelation itself. We can say that what we're reading here in Revelation 12, 15, and 16 about this big flood uh, is basically people who are mo motivated to come and attack Israel, uh, persecute them, uh, try to destroy them. But uh, God is supernaturally protecting them, preserving them, nourishing them. And uh, so that makes Satan even more angry. And verse 17 says he goes out to make war with the rest of her offering or those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, meaning he's going against believers, against the brethren, all out against those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan is going after them. Okay, So this is all happening in the second half of the tribulation uh, for that three and a half year period. So this brings us to the end of uh, chapter 12. Any questions? Any Is everybody with me so far? Any doubts? Any questions? Uh, you've been following? Is it clear? So um, there's Aaron's question. Are we going to experience all this? Uh, remember, the church has been taken out of the way. Right? So you and I will not be around because Revelation chapter 4 and 5, the church has been raptured. So we are not here. Revelation 6 verse 1 begins the seven-year tribulation. So we will not be around. But all these things are going to be fulfilled on the earth for the people who are there at that time. Is that okay, Aaron? You got it, Aaron? Uh, 
Okay. All right, let's close. Uh, I know our time is up, but we need to take a break and then get ready for our next class. Um, could somebody just pray with us? And maybe, Dave, why don't you pray? Then we'll dismiss, please. And Ms. Abel, thank you once again, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this class. Thank you. I've been learning so much from your words. Um, all these things that we are learning, Lord, but we pray that uh, have, have it on us to understand and come to us, Lord Jesus, so that we can know your days and know, so that we can be ready and be prepared for, for your day to come, Lord Jesus. So thank you once again, and we submit everything to them. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Um, please take a break, and then we will see you in the next class. God bless. Bye now.